most of us uh, enjoy watching movies, and uh, it's interesting to uh, occasionally, if you're playing trivia games, uh, to uh, remember who starred and what. Uh, I know we had a get together online here uh, in uh, mid December with my family, and uh, my oldest daughter, Victoria. Uh, sort of picked up on uh, what they love to do in England, which is have a pub quiz. Uh, and uh, she just had us in all directions. And it was a pretty close tie between uh, uh, youngest son and uh, youngest daughter. And uh, she was agonizing over, well, how could I make this more balanced? Perhaps I should put more Star Wars questions in for the sake of the younger set. And then we could have a, 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 a clear winner. Uh, in my case, uh, I got uh, just about everything uh, uh, except the ones I didn't get. And uh, fortunately, Shelley wrote uh, four or five of the critical ones in there. And it's surprising as you pay, you know, you follow uh, through on trivia and you remember certain stars of this movie or that movie. Uh, growing up in England, uh, I took uh, uh, literature uh, in uh, the last couple of years in high school. And uh, of course, we had to study Shakespeare, uh, which meant for uh, quite a few hours a week, uh, we uh, were gathered around and we would read the plays of Shakespeare. And uh, then the other uh, instructor would uh, uh, lecture us on the history of literature. But um, one of the uh, side benefits of uh, being an English major at that uh, time uh, was that uh, we got cheap tickets to the Bristol Old Vic. And the Bristol Old Vic is the oldest operating English language theater. And so uh, some really big names uh, worked out their apprenticeship at the Bristol Old Vic. Sir Anthony Hopkins, for example, Animal, Animal, Hannibal Lecter. Uh, he uh, was seen regularly in plays at the Bristol Old Vic. And they were changed to play, by the way, every two weeks. Uh, Alan Rickman, uh, individuals like that. Uh, when I was able to take Shelley there and uh, we went to the uh, Theater Royal in Bath, which is only eight or nine miles down the road, uh, she was able to see uh, uh, one of the stars there from the uh, Fox family. And uh, then uh, I said, well, how, wh why are we going to see this play? Because I know this actor. Uh, and uh, last time we were there, we uh, snuck off one evening uh, to go to the Bristol Old Vic. And why are we going to see Cyrano de Bergiac? Well, because this actor I know is plays in Poldark. Really? I didn't realize that. And so uh, some of the uh, regular stars in uh, British uh, miniseries or perhaps in the movies, uh, quite a, a few internationally uh, acclaimed stars, uh, worked out their apprenticeship uh, in this little tiny theater called the Bristol Old Vic. Uh, or appear. I know uh, it was quite popular for big stars, Charlton Heston, uh, people like that, who would appear in the uh, Theatre Royal Bath uh, as sort of something that they enjoyed uh, as a, a distraction. And so uh, we think of the uh, those who appear, and we also perhaps are aware of those who appear in the supporting roles in movies, and maybe they crop up in uh, um, trivia here and there. Uh, we are aware also that there are quite a few who appear in supporting roles around the time of Jesus' birth. We think of the shepherds. Yeah, they're there in a supporting role. Uh, we think of uh, the villains like Herod and uh, his soldiers. Uh, we think of the uh, three wise men who uh, came uh from uh, the east, we say three. Uh, there is no, that's just a tradition. Uh, the Magi uh, who come to visit the child Jesus. In the months that follow, there is uh, quite a, a mention of, uh, we'll say, bit players or supporting cast in the story of Jesus, especially when he is uh, presented at the temple uh, not too long after his birth. Uh, Mary is restored to the community, of course. Uh, after giving birth, uh, the law said she had to uh, self-isolate for a little while. And, of course, uh, traditionally, uh, the law directed that uh, firstborn males belonged to uh, God. And so uh, if you could, you had to get to the temple and present this child to the priests. And Jesus is presented at the temple uh, for his parents. It's about a 10-mile trek from where he's born 
up to the temple on uh, Mount uh, Zion, Mount Moriah. And so uh, they come up there and they come up to offer Jesus to the Lord uh, to go through Mary's uh, sort of acceptance and purification. And we read about this in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. And it tells us that when the time came for this purification, According to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And so we have these young parents taking the 10 mile trek up to Jerusalem. And ironically, they come from Bethlehem which is the center of the the lamb industry, uh, simply because uh, you need a lot of lambs to fulfill the uh, quota of sacrifices at the temple. So logically, you're going to be raising lambs in close proximity to Jerusalem. And they journey up, but they don't bring a lamb. They bring, it tells us, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Why? Because they are poor parents. They don't have a lot of money. They don't have enough to buy a lamb. And you think, well, it's not a major expense, is it? Well, apparently it was for them. Now, Jesus is obviously the star of this story to us. Uh, The whole narrative revolves around his birth and him being presented to the, the temple. But immediately we note in passing that his mom is important. She's in the story. And his dad. And then it goes on to tell us this. And now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And Simeon is an old man. He's powerless. And uh, with all due respect, uh, even, you know, especially in our culture, we we tend to think of elderly people. I think uh, here in a few days, uh, Nellie uh, will be turning 103. And she's in a uh, a senior's home that uh, offers uh, additional care because we think of our seniors as fragile. Uh, We don't expect our seniors to uh, do the dishes after dinner. Uh, We don't expect our seniors. By the way, I'm a senior, and yet I'm still expected to help doing dishes. I'll have to think this one through a little bit later. But getting back to the point, the elderly are considered, well, okay, in, in most cultures they're respected, uh, treated with some sort of affection, but like they're marginalized. We hear this uh, to this day. Uh, we feel as though we don't count. We don't matter. The young have taken over. And if, when you lack energy, when you lack uh, vitality, which is the nature of old age, it can be very precarious. And here old Simeon, uh, he's just a doddery old guy. And it tells us, And Luke gives us this insight. This man was righteous and devout. And he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit is upon him. So he is a man of prayer, devotion, and he feels a connectedness to his father in heaven. And he has also somehow or other been able to discern uh, by the influence of the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. He's going to live long enough, he believes, to see the Lord Kyrios uh, sending the Christ, the Savior, to his people. And so, against the backdrop of his old age, against the backdrop of him being feeble and just shuffling along, in the midst of Roman oppression, Uh, Being very aware of uh, the political intentions within his own nation, Uh, the zealots over here, the Essenes way over there, the Sadducees way up there looking down their noses at everybody, and the Pharisees wagging their fingers at everybody. He lives in a confusing and distressing time, and there's really not much to live for for him because he's old. He can't work anymore. Uh, He's probably feeling, and there's no mention of a devout family that sort of 
brings him over on the ox cart so he can get to the temple. He just is getting by. And here, this young couple walk toward the temple carrying a child. And it tells us under inspiration, he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, now here's a dramatic scene, which is typical of any sweeping epic. There might be uh, a suddenly an aside where a little detail is worked out. Um, if you're a Star Wars fan, uh, it's been said that all the best lines go to the robots. You know, uh, uh, Luke Skywalker is a straight man and it is R2-D2 uh, or uh, 3PO who, who are the, the, uh, the wise guys. And in fact, uh, as uh, um, uh, Luke Skywalker uh, uh, said in one interview, he said, uh, trust George Lucas to give all the best lines to the robots. In other words, they're not the, the featured player, but somehow or other they have the witty lines, the little interchanges that sort of say, oh, well, it kind of breaks up the movie, doesn't it? That makes it interesting. And here Simeon, in this incredible sweeping drama, is suddenly the focus for a moment of a few scenes. And he's been reassured, you know, you're not going to die until you see the salvation of Israel, the consolation of Israel. And... Here come mom and dad, and they're carrying the baby. And he is overwhelmed with the idea that this is the Messiah. And so he walks over to them, and to their surprise, he takes him from their arms. And he turns his eyes to heaven, and he gives thanks. And he says, this is the only reason I'm still here. I'm old, I'm poor, but suddenly there is a moment where he realizes that he too is in this incredible sweeping drama of history. And he goes on to say, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now you look at that, and you know, oh, that's nice. He's acknowledging how important Jesus is. But before we rush past this, I want to point out a couple of things to you. Uh, this declaration begins, Lord. Now in the Greek, and as you know, I speak fluent Greek. Just a little humor there. You can snicker there, Mark. Um, I don't speak any Greek. And uh, I don't even claim to understand anything about Greek grammar. But I knew, do know that the a typical word for Lord is kyrios. And kyrios denotes uh, a sound, uh, a, a term of respect. It might be applied even to uh, a human being. Some liken it to uh, uh, sir or, well, not, not exactly mister, but sir, or uh, certainly acknowledging the superiority in, in rank prestige, privilege, power, things like that. Uh, but it's a fairly broad word. The word that Simeon utters here, according to Luke, is not kyrios, but rather despot. Now, it doesn't take much for you to figure out the meaning of the word, because it comes into English. When we say somebody is a despot, that is a very negative connotation. It means somebody is totally in and completely in charge. And in English, we, we imply in that word that this individual not only has complete power, but they don't care how they use it. And in this context, the Greek word is despot, despote. And it implies that Simeon, in fact, it doesn't imply, it just totally and completely confirms that Simeon sees himself as the complete property uh, his life is completely at the disposal of his father in heaven. And he doesn't, he's not embarrassed to use that word because to him that's a positive thing. And he goes on to say, now you're letting your servant depart in peace 
Now, the concept of uh, invoking peace, we usually say, uh, good luck, don't work too hard, things like that in the English language. We have certain things, but always in uh, Middle Eastern col cultures, uh, if you're Muslim, it's uh, salam alaikum, alaikum as salam. Uh, in uh, Hebrew uh, culture, it is what? Shalom, shalom, uh, uh, avenu shalom alaikum. Uh, greetings like that. Uh, may you have peace. May peace be upon you. When it translates into English, I remember the first time seeing, it uh, must have been, was it 1988, something like that, when we had the World Exposition in uh, the World Expo in Vancouver. I was able to go there for a day and to schlep around and see uh, many of the exhibits uh, uh, with my uh, teenagers. Uh, and as they were witnessing these things, I remember coming to the uh, uh, exhibit for uh, Saudi Arabia. And the first thing I saw was uh, a, a, a huge, what I thought was an oil tanker turned into uh, a, a boat that was devoted entirely to shipping lambs, sheep, from Australia to Saudi Arabia for uh, uh, the, uh, the annual festivals. Uh, twice a year where uh, lambs were required. And for the first time, I read closely and began to understand a little bit more how uh, Islam shaped the entire culture and thinking of Saudi Arabia. And when there were constant references to Muhammad, P-B-U-H followed his name. Uh, what, what on earth is that all about? P-B-U-H, P-B-U-H, what's that? Peace be upon him. It's just part of the language. Uh, bless the prophet. Peace be upon him. I am a descendant. I remember King Hussein uh, of Jordan uh, speaking once in an interview I saw uh, and uh, referring to uh, being a descendant of the prophet. Peace be upon him. This is the language. And so when Simeon says despote, despot, he acknowledges God is completely in the control of him personally. And he says, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. This was a typical type of exchange between a master and a slave who had received an assignment. Now, we could philosophize what that assignment may be. Maybe he's on night watch, typically was one example I read. And that uh, after serving on night watch, which was a pretty arduous duty, and then at a particular time, they would call his master. His master would say, okay, you're off the job now. And he wouldn't uh, uh, say thank you, uh, as we might in the English language. I really appreciate this or something like that. But uh, the, it would be the responsibility of the slave, the servant, the bond servant to say, Essentially, thank you for letting your servant depart in peace. Thank you for relieving me of this onerous task. And this is exactly what Simeon says. You know, Lord, the one who completely owns me, thank you for letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Now, you've shown me ahead of time that I'm going to live long enough to see the Messiah. This is a part I play, but it's been difficult to play it because, you know, and again, I don't want to get too much of a downer here because many of us are seniors. We've still got a lot of vitality in our midst. None of us is volunteering. I've not heard any of you say, I just wish it was all over. On a rare occasion, I've heard that. I remember one individual in his 80s who'd had a pretty hard life. After he lost his wife, I saw him at a worship service a few, uh, a couple of years later. And he said, just sincerely, he said, uh, oh, you've no idea the aches and pains, he said, to this age. He said, I'm at that stage where I just want to fall asleep and go we be with mama. Being, go be with the wife of his 50 some odd years who had borne him 12 children. And that's what's his sincere thought. Some people reach a particular age and they say, okay. Enough is enough. I've lived a full life. So, if you will, master, despot, 
Now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people. You can read over that quickly, but it's, this is an individual who somehow grasped the glimmer of hope that Isaiah has put forward that this Messiah will belong to the world. This light will bring revelation to the Gentiles. What are you worried about the Gentiles for? We want the consolation of Israel, don't we? No, this little scene where this bit player plays out his scene, he says, for he emphasizes your purpose is for all mankind and for glory to your people Israel. Now, the real glory for the people of Israel was that they now had a Messiah who could actually do the job they were supposed to do. They were supposed to be the light to the world. They were not. They were just, eh, you know, a bit of a pain to the world. In fact, if you read in Romans chapter 2, Paul chastises his countrymen by saying, you think you've done a great job? The name of our God is held in contempt around the world because of you losers. That's right, you losers. He said, you're no better off than the Gentiles. We all need the hope of the world who is Jesus. And this is exactly what uh, Simeon is putting forth. The light of revelation. The hope of Israel is the glory, the only glory that the people of Israel can lay claim to. The savior of all humanity is born through the lineage of our beloved King David. We share flesh and blood with him, which, by the way, you guys do. But, you know, he shared our flesh and blood first. He came unto his own, Paul says, and his own received him not. And so as we unpack this little exchange, this little scene in this incredible movie, we see, wow, what, what Simeon is declaring. And he goes on then to speak some very hard words to hear. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Uh, that's a lot to say. What is he saying? Well, Jesus himself said, I came to bring a sword, not peace. In other words, when truth enters into this quagmire of lies, when light penetrates into this pitch dark world, is going to stir up some controversy. So Jesus sees and is told by, uh, foretold by Simeon to see in his ministry strife and also stress for his mother. And that's a really telling little aside. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, he says to Mary. Wow. Nothing is harder for a parent to witness than the suffering of their child. Nothing is harder for a parent to agonize over than to witness their own child going through rejection, hurt, struggling to make it, make it somehow in this world and not be able to do very much of anything about it. Because at the end of the day, all you can do is support, love, encourage, but you just can't, quote, do it all for them, unquote. And Mary is forewarned of this. And of course, as you think about this, You have to meditate on the fact that Joseph is going to depart early from this epic movie and Jesus will be left to experience what it is to be, quote, the head of a household, the firstborn of many children in this household, several children, I should say. And he's going to be the one who has to comfort and strengthen his mother, make sure there's provision for um, uh, feeding the uh, younger brothers and sisters. He's going to be the one who has to, to, to shoulder a certain amount of worry. And we, uh, we understand that uh, Mary is not, quote, 
to be revered or worshipped or prayed to or anything like that. As I mentioned uh, uh, briefly in a sermon or two ago, it, it is nice to at least acknowledge, and Luke will do this for us. He will acknowledge the role of women. He mentions a man. He will also mention a woman. And not to digress too far in this, but I imagine Luke, who is Paul's traveling companion, having many philosophical discussions about this. And I imagine, and this is just total and complete fabrication on my part, but I can imagine Paul sort of encouraging Luke as he begins to gather the story of Jesus and the disciples and the church and to document it by interviewing them all and discussing it with Mary herself, saying, don't forget to balance this story and bring out the role that all the women play. And Luke perhaps saying, why should I do that? Women don't have any status and role in this society. Uh, they're supposed to be, as we might say today, barefoot and pregnant and staying in the kitchen. Uh, why should we worry about emphasizing their role? And Paul's saying, don't be a, don't be a schmuck, because they were Jews, so they would talk back and forth in Hebrew. Don't be a schmuck. In Christ, we have found that there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Yeah, there is neither bond nor free. Okay, stop nagging me. I get the point. There is neither male nor female. Oh, how do you translate that? How do you communicate that to people in a culture that understands women are second class? Women can't, uh, in most areas of the Roman Empire, cl lay claim to property. They can't just willy-nilly divorce their husbands. They can't say that these children are mine, especially if they're slave women. And so how are you going to change the culture, the mindset, the thinking of people? How are you going to communicate to them our father's true intention for his children? You'd better make sure that you fill in the whole story. Oh, okay. I get your point, Luke would say. And Luke then fills in, quote, the rest of the story. And some of these asides are very telling. Uh, here we have the, uh, the announcement, you know, uh, the, uh, the Messiah is going to stir up controversy. There will be a falling and a rising of many in Israel. They're going to take sides, in other words. <clears throat> he, is, he is God's sign to the people, but he's going to, make, he's going to be opposed because people don't act. Oh, great. We, we got a word directly from our father in heaven. And he says that we don't understand the purpose of the law. We don't understand how to relate to our God. Uh, we don't basically know much of anything. We're way off track. But we're Pharisees. We know better than anybody else. How dare you try to tell us this? And by the way, don't claim to be the son of God because we don't think that is right and proper. In fact, if you push that argument any further, we're going to crucify you. And as you witness this, Mary, this is going to stab you through the heart. And so as you look at this and you understand Jesus living through the experience of losing his stepfather, I think personally that uh, there's some scenes in uh, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, that helped me to understand that a little bit more. What was it like to be the mother of Jesus who is God in the flesh? And there's a, a lovely scene where uh, he is talking to his mother. And remember, she's Jewish, so she doesn't take any guff from her boys. And uh, he, she says, what are you building? And he says, I'm building a temple for a wealthy Roman, a centurion, someone like that. And she looks at the temple, uh, I beg your pardon, the table. And, and she, she puts a, a picture on it and figures out how it's going to sit. Because we Jews don't sit around a table. We don't sit on chairs like this. We sit on cushions. We recline. We, we, uh, we, we eat differently. We and he said, well, no. He said, this is the, the coming thing. This is, this is what the aristocracy, uh, the, the, the wealthy in the Roman Empire are going to, tables. And I've built one under the direction because, you know, he's represented as a carpenter. And she looks at it and she tries to consider sitting by a table and she says to him, it'll never catch on, which, of course, is a humorous little exchange. But it tells you, hey, Jesus and his mom have a mature adult adult relationship. 
And he gives her a little guff now and then, and she gives it to him back. Remember, I carried you nine months in my body for this. You, you treat me this way. Oh, come on, mom. You can't keep overusing that sign. It's just a, just a really touching picture where he surprises her as she's trying to pour something out. And he gives her a little smooch. And he says, hey, mom, thanks for dinner. You know, any son who has appreciated his mother is going to occasion. My mother was shorter than me by a lot. Uh, and it didn't uh, bother her that occasionally I would put my arms around her, make her feel like a little midget. And uh, uh, it didn't bother her too much. But uh, and she she respected the fact uh, she used to enjoy my sermons online. And she also enjoyed giving me her evaluation from time to time. And uh, she might tell other people, uh, you know, what she got out of it or how much she appreciated it. But she'd also tell me that, uh, you know, well, I'm not sure about this or I enjoyed that or, you know. And uh, maybe she would couch her praise in, you know, your sister thought that was really good. Oh, thanks, mom. Uh, what about you? Well, your sister thought it was OK. You know, this, this type of thing. This is the way you could put back and forth. This is a Jewish mother. This is a Jewish son. And, you know, my boy's special, but he's still my boy. This type of relationship. And I, I take that and I consider the prophet here, old Simeon, looking at her and saying, this, this raising this child is going to tear the heart out of you. And I flash forward to the time when Jesus on the cross looks at John, his bestest, bestest buddy, and says, John, look after mom. Mom, you can trust John. My death is going to put a hellacious amount of stress on my sisters and my brothers. It's going to rupture the fabric of my family for the time being. John, there are all sorts of things you could be doing and should be doing, but the number one responsibility I want you to have is for my mom. Kind of touching it away. A little bit of an aside that gives you an insight into his heart for the supporting cast, the bit players. I mentioned, of course, Luke's penchant for bringing online uh, for us the, uh, the other players, the supporting cast, if you will. And his arguments with Paul, I, I, you know, I make those up, obviously, but his, his discussion of well, how do I write this? Well, you know, Matthew did a nice job. Mark just gave a skeleton outline. Matthew, he fills it in, and it's really, really good for our people, the Jews. But, uh, and, and, and John, you know, we don't even know about him. He keeps talking about writing stuff, but he might do it when he's really old, way after we're gone, this sort of idea. But right now, you're going to systematically put together in a literary form the story from beginning to where we are today, the Acts of the Apostles that continue. And he said, I want you to, to keep this balance. And so fortunately for us, there's another story. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Now, that's interesting as well. Uh, we, we pick up uh, Anna in the Greek, uh, probably named uh, for Hannah uh, in Hebrew. Uh, the mother of Samuel, who goes through the experience of uh, giving her child over at the temple as well. Uh, in this case, though, it's, it's interesting that we have another little slice of life represented here because it says she is the tribe of Asher. Now, the people who returned to the kingdom of Judah, well, let's use that expression, uh, were predominantly uh, Levites. Uh, because they are attracted to the temple. Benjamites, because that's their, you know, traditional land. Uh, and uh, some of the children of Judah. The overwhelming majority are still in the diaspora. Asher was one of the northern ten tribes. Uh, they're, they're referred to as scattered abroad. And yet here this woman is devoted to the temple uh, and it tells us that she is from one of the tribes that you don't hear anything about, Asher. And yet here she steps up and she enters into this sweeping saga. She also was advanced in years. 
she's elderly and there's nothing more useless than an older man who can barely walk shuffles into the temple and an older woman who has no strength and very little respect given and yet here she is just having her scene if you will right in the middle of this epic movie and we are told she has lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84 very specific details that luke feels the need to bring to us so probably married in her mid-teens widowed in her early 20s and now alone for 60 years that's kind of a sad story in a way no mention of a support group matrix family she did not depart from the temple worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day and coming up at that very hour she began to give thanks to god you know just like simeon had done and just speaking of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Okay, we could focus on Simeon, but hey, the, she, the, the camera pans now to another player, and it's a woman. Again, the least of the powerful influences in that time and in that place. And she too has been waiting and waiting and waiting for the consolation of Israel, for the strength. And here in this little, little sort of part of the movie, uh, we have dealt with the lonely, the aged, the different disenfranchised or the scattered who typically are not represented here. Uh, we have dealt with Jews who come to the temple who declare impulsively, instinctively, this child is for all, for the Gentiles. We, the insiders, know that he is for all, the outsiders as well. Uh, we see his parents in poverty and yet walking the 10 miles or so to the temple and bringing the most humble of gifts yet accepted. And... We see Jesus in the midst of all of this political uncertainty, all this turmoil, all the disruption, and we see the hand of God. We see the Holy Spirit at work. And it is if, I don't know if you, in growing up, had this experience, but my dad, uh, you know, among the many jobs he held to try to uh, uh, get by when I was very young, uh, was he would work sometimes, or my mom also would work a shift at the cinema, which was uh, down at the bottom end of Fish Ponds, where I grew up. And in this little suburb of Fish Ponds, uh, of course, typically every little suburb had a movie house, just as every small town did uh, when you were growing up. And it was, the cinema, for whatever reasons, was called the Van Dyke, the Van Dyke Cinema. I remember my dad was able to take me there when he was working and uh, Chris, he would get in for free and I would sit in the back for free, uh, providing the movie was acceptable. And uh, to this day, well, of course, they've gutted the place and turned it into a pub. Uh, there again, if you walk just a few, uh, maybe a hundred, a couple of hundred yards, they've gutted the post office and turned that into a pub as well. So old buildings get repurposed in England in that way. But when advertising and my dad i remember taking me to see the the ten commandments uh and the robe you know some of those old uh movies when they first came out uh and uh my dad enjoyed the cinema and i still do to this day but the cliche was uh in this blockbuster maybe featuring ten commandments charlton heston edgar g robinson and a cast of thousands that would be the way it would be described when a blockbuster movie was put out there we don't say that today we probably emphasize the uh, cgi uh uh the computer generated immigrant images you know things like that back then it was a cast of thousands cue the red sea 
Cue the chariots. Cue the Egyptian army. Cue the children of Israel. You know, action. A cast of thousands. And here, where Jesus clearly is the star, we have been introduced to a few of the cast members, the supporting cast. And in so doing, we are reminded that we too are part of this supporting cast. We find ourselves included in this epic drama that is the story of Jesus that is now unfolding right after his birth with the, the poor, the disenfranchised, the lonely, perhaps those who have endured in faith, especially in Simeon and Anna's case, for a long time wondering when they would see the consolation of Israel. That's a pretty tough thing. I know perhaps there are times when you doubt your, your place in the movie as well. Uh, you probably have times when you doubt whether or not that there's even any consideration for your needs or your feelings in this saga. One quotable quote I wanted to share with you is from Elizabeth Elliot. Waiting on God requires the willingness to bear uncertainty, to carry within oneself the unanswered question. Lifting the heart to God about that question whenever it intrudes upon one's thoughts. There's a lot of uncertainty that we will all face going forward. And some of the certainty is that there will be opposition and distress. There's a lot of uncertainty and unanswered questions that we have to carry through this journey. Just like Simeon, just like Anna, and just like some of the other characters who come forward. And yet they feature in this movie and are given their own scene, just as you and I are given our own scene. You know, um, my uh, my wife really enjoys Father Brown Mysteries, and uh, we even uh, went to Blockley to see uh, the, the church where these uh, movies are filmed. And uh, after we had uh, talked about it a little bit, my sister said, oh, yeah, I didn't know you were interested in Father Brown Mysteries. She said, they're filmed up. Yeah, we just went to Blockley and saw them. She said, you know, uh, I've on a couple of occasions been an extra in those movies. Really? Yeah. Uh, she has a daughter who's a, a dancer and into um, performance and so forth. And so she said, Mom, now you're retired. You have time. You should sign up with the same agency I'm with and you can get work as an extra. And so she's had uh, occasion to be in a couple of uh, movies or uh, things like Father Brown Mysteries, made for television movies. And so uh, Shelley actually uh, figured out a couple of episodes that uh, my sister was in. And she talked about the fact that it took them hours to make her up, to make it all authentic. And she was included and so forth. And then she recorded uh, a scene or two in which my sister was included. And sure enough, there was a cast of dozens. And at one particular point, she froze it. And she said, there's your sister. I didn't even recognize her. Uh, yeah, you know, I would have never recognized her in a thousand years. Well, because she's in makeup, she's in disguise, she's in costume, you know, everything else and so forth. But apparently it was important for her to be at that place for those few moments while the camera was rolling. And she was included in Father Brown's Mysteries. Whatever you and I think of the role that we play, wherever we happen to be as the drama unfolds, to God the Father, our part is important. We have been included in this story. And as this story goes forward, yeah, Jesus is the main character. He is the lead character. But you need to focus on the fact that includes a cast of thousands. This particular illustration to me says a great deal. I used it to talk about what it means to be the high priest, uh, to bring his family before the Father in heaven. 
But you could equally as well imagine him leading the cast, the Charlton Heston role. But behind him, the cast of thousands, or in this particular case, cast of billions. And we're in the credits as well. We're in the story. And it's important we not lose track of that. And that as we read these little scenarios, these little incidents, we not read over them too quickly. And we realize that the role, the, the words of Simeon are recorded for a reason. The words of Anna for a reason. The story of the wise men for a reason. On and on it can go. Because we too are included in this scenario. When you get to feeling disenfranchised, the part of the scattered abroad, uh, when you get to feeling as though there is no answer to the unanswerable questions that you think you are carrying, as the encouragement was given, lift them to God and realize that, yes, there is an answer and it will in due time be revealed. As you feel as though you're walking alone, remember you are not. You are walking in the footsteps of the one who's gone before us, just as the original disciples did. I hope as you read through these stories at this time of the year, this speaks to your heart, just as I tried to explain these stories today, speak to all of ours. Let's just take a moment to ask God's blessing on our fellowship uh, before we close. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can just read through some very simple stories today, but realize in a way that you have laid us exactly in this narrative, that we are included in this saga and this drama, that we too have our little moments when the camera focuses on us. And as far as we're concerned, uh, this, for each and every one of us individually, this movie just involves, well, us and you, the Holy Spirit, bringing us through Jesus, our Savior, to know our Father in heaven. So wherever we are today, we ask your comfort and strength. Whatever the unanswered questions may be, we ask your insight and encouragement. And whatever the stresses and strains may be, we ask you to reestablish us in the light and the hope of the gospel. And that it not only be for us, but also shine through us and bring encouragement and strength to others. We thank you for this season of year, the year as we celebrate the Advent. And we are reminded that you, God, dwells among us as our Savior, Jesus. And for that, we are grateful today and we pray in his name. Amen.